just a quick recap on where we are on all the techie stuff. Um, none of you at the moment can speak unless you're one of our uh, sort of panel speakers, but obviously you can when we get to the Q&A session. And in the meantime, you can send messages. I am, as you've seen, completely incompetent, but we've got the brilliant Pete Radcliffe with us, keeping an eye on all things techie. So if you've got a problem, send a message with a few fireworks in it, and hopefully Pete or I will pick it up. Um, I think we're going to record this session. Um, we're going to think a little bit afterwards then about whether and how we use it. We've obviously got a variety of people on the panel. Um, we want to have a really open, interesting discussion. Um, if you're a working journalist, obviously you're not going to bother telling us that you're here, but because if you're a working journalist, you're not telling us you're here, we're going to think afterwards about whether we publish this or not. In the meantime, if you want to ask a question, but you don't want to be recorded, that's completely fine, but just write your question in the, in the chat and hopefully it'll be one of the ones that we pick up. Uh, so before I introduce our panel, and um, really, we have got really a great range of speakers from, I'd say, across the labour movement. I'm going to attempt a brief summary of where I think we are. And then the panellists are all going to correct me. <laughs> so, in short, where I think we are is heading towards the infamous cliff. The one that we all talked about for three years and people kept telling us that we were scaremongering. It seems highly unlikely, if you listen to Katya Adler, on Brexit cast, as I did yesterday, that the UK is going to reach a comprehensive agreement with the EU uh, before the end of this year. The last EU summit, which was, I think, last Friday, the 12th of June, uh, ended with a huge number of what, when I worked for the European Commission, we used to call square brackets. So bits of agreement still not filled in. I think probably more square brackets with no text than actually text in some places. A number of really contentious issues, obviously for us as Labour members, the massive one of the level playing field, um, particularly important in terms of workers' rights and environmental standards, but also, you know, from fish to state aid, there's a huge amount that still remains to be agreed. The result was that the EU and the UK have agreed to intensify the talks. So the good news for anyone heading to a beach this summer in the UK is that you shouldn't find yourself socially distanced from Boris Johnson on his beach towel, because in theory, he's going to be working on these negotiations all summer. They're going to be meetings in July and August and September. And as Richard will confirm, the European Commission deciding to meet in August really means that they're, you know, they're very keen to make progress because they don't give up their holidays very easily in Brussels. Um, there's been a lot of consternation in Brussels that Johnson appears to be rolling back on some of what had previously been agreed in the political declaration. Although uh, apparently he has a great knack for charming European leaders. Um, however, charming or otherwise, the uh, withdrawal agreement is clear. I think it's article 132, but again, I know that Richard will know, makes it clear that uh, there has to be a decision by the end of this month if there is to be an extension of the talks. Now, EU lawyers have got a range of views on whether this is legally possible or not, but what we all know, as people who follow things closely for the last few years, is that in the end, most things are legally possible in Brussels if there's political will. And I suppose that brings us to the point of our discussion today. As members of the Labour Party, what do we think about the political positioning of the Labour Party in relation to this? We're obviously the minority in Parliament. Um, what do people think the political strategy should be? There's a range of different views about this across the party. And interestingly for me, there's a range of different views from people who were pretty much united around the desire to have a public vote on Brexit and people who are definitely united around wanting to remain in the EU. So I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion because I don't think that we have sort of antagonisms within, within certainly within the panel. We've just got people who who have slightly different views on, on, on strategy, really. The panel is really great. Uh, quick introduction to each of them. Uh, Richard Corbett. Now, I am a proud Yorkshireman. So Richard Corbett was actually my MEP for many years. He was the leader of the Labour group in the European Parliament. I'll say the last leader for now, because I remain an optimist. Uh, in that capacity, he was also obviously in the Shadow Cabinet. 
in some of what were probably the calmest times in British politics, <laughs> with the arrival of Jeremy Corbyn, the departure of Jeremy Corbyn, the reappearance of Jeremy Corbyn, and all of Brexit. Um, Christabel Cooper, who is a councillor in Hammersmith and Fulham, but by profession is a data analyst, and for my money is co-author of what I think is probably one of the best, if not the best report on the 2019 general election, which Christabel co-authored with another Cooper, to whom she's not, not related. <laughs> um, we've got Sasha, who I can't currently see on my screen. Um, Sasha is a founding supporter and a national committee member of the uh, left, Labour left anti-Brexit campaign group, Labour for Socialist Europe, which is one of the sponsors of this evening. He's also a very active uh, campaigning member of Streatham CLP. Uh, so he had Chakramuna for a while, but I had Kate Hoey, so he gets no sympathy from me. Um, we've got Charlotte Butterick, who I also can't see, but she's a fellow Yorkshire woman because you could never have too many Yorkshire people on one meeting. Charlotte was a Labour advisor in the European Parliament. And then for the last three years was the liaison between the European Parliament and Westminster. So she accompanied frequently our now party leader, Keir Starmer, out to Brussels during the Brexit negotiations and obviously worked closely with UK MEPs, including Richard. So I don't know if you two have been reunited in recent weeks, but anyway, Charlotte and Richard, you're back together. The band is back together. And then finally, last but not least, we've got Hamish Sanderson, who is the chair of Labour Business by Night and a campaigning Labour lawyer by day and a uh, very active um, and engaged supporter of the Labour Party. And I think in both his Labour business capacity and his lawyer capacity would say that he's got serious concerns about what Brexit means for businesses large and small. And in fact, he, along with the rest of the panel, has been a really active member of pro-European campaigning groups. So that is our panel. And now my, the Michaels, Buckley and Chesson, get a minute of propaganda each. Uh, Mike Buckley, if you're there, do you want to go first? Mike Buckley, are you there? Huh. Well, Mike Buckley, if you're not, the other Michael can go first. Michael Chesson, are you there? Joy, I get to go, f I love going first. Hello everyone, my <laughs> um, I'm the organizer for one of the, possible one of the organi organizations that's put this on. Uh, because you're here, you probably know a fair bit about us already, but um, I'm going to do the slightly sort of difficult and awkward thing of summing up everything that we are in one minute. So um, we're a, a cross-party campaign that exists. Uh, we uh, have lots of Labour left people involved, lots of uh, Greens as well, um, but we're a, a solidly left anti-Brexit campaign and we have led a lot of the work specifically around freedom of movement uh, and a lot of the work inside the Labour Party as well. Um, there's a lot of despondency at the moment, uh, both on the left and on the anti-Brexit movement. I guess our big strategy revolves around three things. Uh, so they've got an 80 majority, but that doesn't mean that we can't change uh, the course of history. And we're going to do that in three different ways. One is by stopping the worst bits of Brexit. So that's stuff around uh, free movement and uh, migrants' rights, but also around all kinds of stuff around the potential incoming apocalypse of a US trade deal. Uh, we're going to make sure that when Labour does get back into power, it's in the right place on stuff like migrants' rights and our relationship to Europe more generally. Um, and thirdly, we're going to try to build movements of resistance that are so big that they can't be ignored. Uh, and so turn outwards to <coughs> social movements. The, the thing that I just very quickly wanted to plug as a specific project that we're running at the moment is the, um, is the uh, alternative mandate. Um, and I'm going to post a link to this in the chat. And it's basically our set of demands, uh, which we've gone through and got a lot of people on board with, um, politicians, trade unionists and so on, uh, our demands on the Brexit negotiation process itself, which I think at the moment we've been on the back foot and we haven't been really raising, largely because we think we don't have much leverage, but it's really important that we do agitate and begin to agitate around a programme uh, for those things. So I'll post that in the chat. I'll also post the, post the link to join us. We're a democratic organisation and by paying as little as one pound a month, you can be a, a full part of our democratic activist uh, community. Um, so please do and uh, have a look at the chat. That was brilliant. That was nearly a minute. Um, the alternative mandate is excellent. So I really would recommend it 
to you all. Have we got the other mic? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Mike Buckley, great. Great. Uh, the Alternative Monday is excellent, by the way. Well done, uh, Michael and Another Europe. Um, so I'm Mike Buckley. I run Labour for European Future um, and we used to be Labour for Public Vote and campaigned uh, with Michael um, and Laura and many others um, to try and get a second referendum in the last parliament, which we nearly got. Um, about five votes off of parliament, apparently. Could have been a different, different world we were living in. Um, and we are now still going and we are still pro-Europeans in the Labour Party. And I think it's I think there are lots of pro-European Labour uh, voices in the Labour Party, including another Europe and Labour for a Socialist Europe as well. And I think it's really important that there are pro-Europeans still present in the Labour Party and still talking about it. And of course, the way that we do that will be different in this parliament and under this leadership than on, in the last parliament, because I think all of us recognise that we need to be 100% focused on whatever's going to make it most likely that we get a Labour government next time round. Partly as a pro-European, because the only possibility of a closer European relationship, however close, and whether that and whether membership or anything else, is well, is if we get a Labour government. So that that's foremost in my mind in in all the things that that, that we're doing. But I think it is really important that there are still people who are talking about pro-Europeanism, the fact that lots of our voters are pro-European, the vast bulk of our, our voters, in fact. Uh, and I mean, in the last election, everyone talks about the Leave voters we lost, but we lost just as many Remain voters to the Lib Dems and SNP and Greens as we did Leave voters to the Conservatives or Brexit Party. And things like that make it really important that our, our voice is still represented. Um, so I will stop there. I will post in the chat um, three things. So one is linked to our website, so you can join us as well. Um, for, for a minimum of three pounds a month, which is a bit more expensive than in the Europe. Um, <laughs> I won't comment on why that might be. Um, and then I, we've just published our post-election report into why Labour lost in 2019, and then looking further back to 2010 and beyond to what's happened to the Labour vote. So I'll post the link to that report as well, and then a, a write-up of that um, that's just been come out today in the Huffington Post. So you can read that and that'll be your bedtime reading, which will be fun for everybody, I'm sure. So <laughs> please join us if you can. We would love you to do that. And it's great to see so many of you here and great to see so many uh, familiar faces. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It is great. We've got 134 people on, which is really impressive. So without further ado, each of our speakers is going to talk for about four minutes. I have a little, can you all see that? I have an egg timer and it's the green one in the middle. I don't know if you can see that. The green one in the middle is four minutes. So I'm going to be very rigorous. Um, then we're going to have a Q&A session. So line your questions up. Um, we're going to start with uh, our former leader in the European Parliament, Richard Corbett. Oh. Thank you very much. Lovely to see you all. So let's get straight into it. We may be discussing a moot point in that the government has said very clearly there will be no extension. The deadline for that decision is nearly up and we need actually to focus on the content. As Mike was saying in his presentation of what they've been working on, those sort of issues. What are our demands for any future Brexit deal? What are we after? Nonetheless, I still think the Labour Party should formally at least say we need an extension. Given that so many others are saying it, from industry to agriculture to trade unions, the Welsh government, the Scottish government, it's beginning to look a little bit odd that the Labour Party, which had rightly made such a song and dance against a no-deal Brexit, which unified everybody in the party, has not said anything. So I think we should, at least as a marker, at least to show later that we did say that if things go wrong, which they may very well do. This is no longer a leave or remain issue. Arguably it's leavers who should be the ones saying, we want a smooth transition. We want to make sure it doesn't go wrong because they, they should have an interest in showing that Brexit isn't as disastrous uh, as we've all been making out. You'd expect them to be the ones to say, let's have some more time and get it right. So this is not a leave or remain issue, we've already left. It's a question about getting the right sort of deal, the best sort of deal we can for the future. So I think we should call for an extension. 
but do so in an intelligent and careful way. We should use the language of saying, this is not having an extension, is another bit of Boris Johnson exuberance, overconfidence, bluster, just as he's done on so many aspects of the coronavirus crisis. He said, yes, it'll be no problem. Yes, we can do this. Yes, we can do that. And it's turned out not to be true. We should be saying that. We should also say there may be a more sinister aspect to this, that maybe he doesn't want a deal. He actually wants this no deal Brexit. Because as Laura said at the beginning, that is a cliff edge. Let's recall where we are now. We're in a transition phase where we have the status quo as regards all our rights and obligations in the EU. Nothing has changed in that sense. But at the end of that, unless we've negotiated replacement arrangements, all legal arrangements suddenly cease overnight. That's crucial for trade matters. We would suddenly fall under WTO rules with customs barriers and tariffs. It's true for security matters like police cooperation, access to police databases and so on, European arrest warrant. It's true for access to research programs, Erasmus student exchanges, you name it, all would suddenly cease without having any replacement. That is a catastrophic scenario which we need to avoid. But that means we need a new deal by October unless we get an extension. So it's not surprising that many people are suspicious that the government in refusing an extension doesn't actually want a deal. After all, the neoliberal right wing of the Conservative Party, which is in the ascendancy in that party, have long wanted to avoid a deal because they think any deal keeps us aligned to European standards and European rules. Their reason for wanting Brexit in the first place was to break away from those European standards on consumer protection, workplace rights, environmental standards. They want a free-for-all market, a Trump-style market, and they want where corporations can do they, what they want, and they want to realign Britain with Trump's USA and tear us away from our European neighbours. They actually want that. So I think that's another reason for us to lay down a marker. The talks are now in deadlock precisely because Boris Johnson won't, despite what he signed up to in the, with, in the Brexit deal, the political declaration on what we would sign up to for the future, despite saying we would have a level playing field on these things, he's reneging on that. He's reneging on a number of other things as well. And that's why the rest of the European Union is very suspicious that he doesn't want a deal at all. So in these circumstances, I think it's rather odd that Labour hasn't, in a carefully calibrated way, challenged him on this and said, you aren't actually asking for an extension because you don't want a deal at all. And if you're serious about a deal, you need more time. Even in the best circumstances without the COVID crisis, we would have needed more time. With it, it's unthinkable that we could get all these things wrapped up by October. That's reality, and we should say so. Now, we should do it, as I said, in a nuanced way. Um, Kia is perfectly aware of all these issues. He's one of the best, best, best briefed people in the party about this. He's capable of handling that in such a nuanced way. And I think we would do better to say that. That being said, as I hinted at the beginning, our focus should mostly be though on the content. What do we want in a post-Brexit deal? We want to keep our access to Europe, access for our exporters, access for our supply chains, access to European research programs, student exchanges, security issues, police databases, European arrest warrant. That's what we should be after, along with maintaining those European standards on, on food safety, on workplace rights, on consumer protection, on environmental standards. We don't want to devalue and go to American standards. And with those key messages in there somewhere, we should tuck in that we don't think it's possible to achieve that without an extension. Thank you.
Thank you, that was extremely clear. I realise I've not yet developed the art of interrupting people online, <laughs> but that was really clear, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, Christabel Cooper, who I think has got a slightly different take on this. Oh, Christabel, are you there? I am here, I am here. Um, yes, so I'd just like to take us all back to 10 p.m. on the 12th of December. Um, which I'm sure we all remember when the exit poll came out and when we realised that Boris Johnson was going to get a landslide. And in that moment, I think we realised that we were going to leave the EU, but further than that, it was the end of the Labour Party being able to directly influence government policy in the way that we had done in the past two years, because of course the Tories didn't have a majority. Um, you know, I, it, it's, well, it's not that we, you know, we've seen the last week that the government can absolutely change its mind on things um, and has done so on, on, on quite a lot of occasions. But we've got to be aware where the pressure on the government to change its mind is coming from. It's ultimately coming from Tory MPs. I chaired a meeting of my local European movement um, with Dominic Grieve as one of the panellists, and he was just making the point that the best way to try and influence Boris Johnson is via Tory MPs. If they get enough emails in their inbox from local businesses, from local people, saying we are really worried about what's going to happen if we leave with no deal, then they may well put pressure on Boris Johnson to change his mind. And I think it's interesting, the latest U-turn that the government has um, has undertaken on the free school meals issue. Um, you know, Labour has been pushing uh, the issue of holiday hunger for at least a year, I think. And yet it took, you know, a Premier League footballer getting enough Tory MPs. It was, it was the bit when I listened to the radio in the morning and they were saying that Tory MPs were now lobbying Boris to change that policy, that you realised that he was probably going to change his mind. But again, you know, the sad fact is, is that Labour, because we are facing an 80 seat majority with the Tories, we cannot directly influence what happens. We cannot change Boris's mind. If he wants to do something stupid, like go for a, a no deal Brexit, like not ask for an extension, we cannot directly influence that anymore because we lost in December. Um, However, you know, that's not the only reason for not for, for opposing things, just because we can't change them. And I, you know, I'd like to say I agree with pretty much every single word of what Richard said in terms of his analysis of, of what, what is happening, what is likely to happen, what the consequences are. Um, and, you know, there is, there is a question of whether the Labour Party should be offering leadership on this, whether we should be trying to change people's minds. And I think I would entirely have agreed with Richard had it not been for the coronavirus crisis. Um, it is just simply almost impossible to get cut through in this crisis. And, and you know, no, no wonder we've had a thousand people dying a day. This is something I know the word unprecedented is being used too often, but it, this is uh, un unprecedented. And, you know, you sort of think of all of our arguments about what a disaster no deal would be. Um, you know, one of the worst estimates was that it would cut 8% off our GDP within, you know, over, over a period of years. We've had 20% off our GDP in one month in April. So it becomes very hard to get it through to people who are not particularly politically engaged that this is an important thing. I mean, the other problem is, is, of course, it takes place in six months time. It's not like those no deal cliff edges where we were literally facing something happening within a couple of weeks. So... I, you know, really reluctantly, my conclusion is that it is very, very hard for us to get that kind of cut through. Um, and, you know, we'd want to be making exactly the constructive case that Richard Corbett made out, that we're not trying to overturn Brexit, that even though perhaps, you know, we might be, um, but we're not, we're, we're, we're trying to just get the best, best Brexit. But I mean, what, what I'm pretty sure would happen if we did oppose, if we did argue for an extension, is that we would immediately be labelled by Boris as a bunch of Ramonas who are trying to undermine Brexit. We secretly want to re rejoin. And it's been quite obvious over the last week that Boris is absolutely itching to start a culture war. You know, you see it over the statues. He wants to reactivate all of those divisions because ultimately that's what got him his 80 seat majority. So he would love it if we opposed that extension, I'm afraid. And we would be rather falling into that, that debate where we, we just get labeled as, as Remainers um, again. So I, you know, I, I, 
and again, and I know I'm not going to make myself popular here by saying this, but I think Keir was right to say that we need to leave those labels behind because they are toxic. I'm not personally going to stop calling myself a Remainer or, you know, or, or stop wearing my, my EU t-shirt. But I think as a, as a party, it doesn't help us. It politically does not help us to be labelled with that. That is, that is essentially playing in, in, into his hands. And I think there are things, you know, again, as Richard said, that we need to achieve. We, we are an internationalist party. We're a party that believes that nations do better when they work together. We believe in international bodies like the UN, like the WHO, like the Commonwealth, like the EU. We believe in those things because they work. And I think we should be arguing for that. But I think we need to be, and, and you know, Richard's right about the sort of deal that we need to end up with with the EU. We need to remain close to them. There is just no way that we should be going down that American food standards route or selling our NHS off or doing any of those any of those things. But I think that the best way that we can make that case is if we decouple it from that remain attack, because I think it became so toxic. And I think we underestimated the extent to which the Leave voters that we really needed to reach out to reacted very badly to, to, that, to that particular label. So I think Keir's right to basically say, okay, you said you're gonna go and get a deal, let's see it, and then judge them, let them fail on their own terms, I'm just coming to the end, Laura. Um, so, um, you know, let, let them fail on their own terms because they will fail because Brexit is a nonsense because, you know, there are no sunlit up plans. But let's be able to say it to them that they failed to achieve them on their own terms, that it wasn't that we didn't believe in Britain or any of this nonsense that they would throw at us. It is that they said they'd get a deal and actually we've ended up worse off or certainly no better off than we were before. And I think that's, that's where we need to be focusing and that's where we need to be arguing really clear again and so good that we've got people who are all pro-europeans um but with some differences of view because i think one of the problems again of the last four years is that a lot of the time we were all in rooms with everyone who just agreed with us so um really interesting thank you christabel next up sasha can i okay. see you, sasha? can you can you hear me okay yay great okay, um i'm going to argue for a campaign for an extension um from a, from a slightly different, but I, I think complementary perspective um, than my comrade Richard. Um, so, uh, firstly, I want to go back. A no-deal Brexit or any of the variants of a hard Brexit that are on offer will be a disaster for workers and for the oppressed and vulnerable. Um, and that's particularly the case in the midst of the fallout from COVID-19. Now, as a, as a socialist, I don't think we should talk about the economy in an abstract way. The economy as it's presently constituted is run by and for the rich but it doesn't follow that the massive economic crisis which i'm sure will result from a hard brexit combined with a pandemic is not a problem on the contrary workers and the poor will be hit hardest and the tory hard right will be working hard to ensure that that's the case they'll also ramp up the attack on migrants and family nationalist fumes that have been poisoning british politics i think in that sense it's a dream scenario for them Meanwhile, if that happens, we'll be even further cut off from the kind of international solidarity and cooperation, both labour movement cooperation and governmental cooperation, which is needed to tackle the multiple crises we face, medical, economic, ecological. Now, the Tories are desperate to avoid real discussion and scrutiny of all this, of what a hard Brexit at the end of the year would really mean. It's clear that already a substantial majority are opposed to the kind of Brexit they want. Um, and since COVID-19, we are in a new situation. And in that sense, I, I, I think I disagree with, with Christabel quite, quite diametrically. We need to delay Brexit so we can submit the huge consequences of what it means in the context of the pandemic to proper democratic scrutiny. I would say it's unfortunate that the leaders and most activists of Labour and the unions have by their silence aided the Tories' evasion of accountability on this, and perhaps more importantly, evaded their own responsibility to the interests of the working class. Even with the problem of the 30th June deadline, if Labour had campaigned on this, it seems likely to me that we could have opened up a severe crisis for the Tories. As it is, the fault lines in their own ranks have remained largely subterranean. Now, there are arguments in circulation and Christabel's made one of the kind of clearer, clearer versions of it I've heard, that it's clever tactics to keep quiet and let the Tories hang themselves. 
Um, but I think um, the Tory, you know, it's true, their plan is not going to work out um, and they're going to have a lot of problems. But as we've seen previously, the Tories having a lot of problems and tripping over their feet doesn't necessarily equate to a win for our side. And I think more generally that approach um, of maintaining silence is a poor one. Um, silence is not a strategy for anything. And I see no reason to think this is an exception. I can't help but feel that Keir Starmer's strategy is an iteration of the same Brexit strategy that failed Labour under Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and it's also indicative of a more general lack of fight against the Tories. I, I think that the people around Starmer, and unfortunately the decisions are being made by the people around Starmer, are scared of being even minimally anti-Brexit. The irony of that being that even without political leadership, the repeated polling suggests that a mass of people already understand that hard Brexit at the end of this year is utter madness. And that seems to include something approaching majority of Leavers. That's why I don't buy this isn't an argument we can win. I've heard people on the left talk about the metropolitan elitist Starmer, blah, blah, trying to impose an anti-Brexit position on the working class. But in fact, if anything, the other way around is closer to the truth. Now, whatever happens about Brexit, we must get serious and step up our international solidarity to defend free movement, to build stronger cross-border links, to fight to level up rights and conditions and standards as part of the fight to transform Europe. But equally, I don't think we should see 30th of June as game over. Failing or not really trying to shift the Tories before the deadline is a defeat, but the deadline is not an immovable reality. It's a rule and a serious struggles rule can be changed. We should continue fighting to delay Brexit and we should insist we cannot afford any more dithering. That's the only way we'll, delaying it is the only way we'll get a seriously different kind of Brexit if that's all that's possible and it's the only way we'll reopen the wider issue of Brexit too. And central to this fight must be a push to shift the labour movement on this to get our party and unions to start fulfilling their responsibilities to the working class and to internationalism. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, really, really clear. And um, although you're slightly in the dark. <laughs> uh, right, next one. I mean, like physically. Um, Charlotte Butterick, I can't see you. Can I hear you? Hello, can you hear me? Yay! Oh, that's a very Channel 4 bookcase in the background there. Yeah, I must win the bookcase prize of the panellists, I think. <laughs> it's better than yours. <laughs> um, but that's not why we're here. So yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so I'd just say well, one of the key things to note, uh, first of all, is that we all, I agree mostly with um, everything all of the panellists have pointed out and the arguments that they've made here. And I just want to make clear, I'm not necessarily against the principle of an extension. It's not a, a question of values and principles at all, I think at this point. It's, as Laura said, the strategy. Um, and I think, of course, as I agree, there's a worrying lack of progress in the talks and both sides need to work extra hard to be able to find a breakthrough in the next few weeks. Um, but I really don't think that asking for an extension is where the focus of Labour as an opposition's energy should be at the minute. Um, and perhaps we need to think about reframing the question instead on how we handle Brexit or rather than this, I think, straight and Christabel put it really, really um really well but i think strain into the yes no de defining people on on whether they're pro or against something extension is quite a dangerous path maybe to go down um so firstly any extension as we know has to be agreed by the end of this month and the eu and both sides ruled that out um when they met last friday so and when the government passed the withdrawal act earlier this year um it decided that to kind of reassure all of their uh, leave, voter, leave voters uh, and persuade the EU that it was prepared to play hardball to make it really difficult, if not impossible, to, to reach any kind of extent, extension without passing primary legislation. So it's clear that the government doesn't want it. They have a majority, so there's not much that we can do. And I hate using the argument, but I think that, you know, it's not just, there's nothing we can do, so we shouldn't do it. There's no point in doing it. It's where do we get the most political capital from argue from argue for, for what we argue. So where do we get the what's the political capital in arguing for something that isn't on the table. There's no mechanism for it for a vote. Um, and we, the Tory majority. Uh, so we I think at the minute 
timing and content, everything is entirely up to the government. Um, so in pragmatic terms, moving forward, how can we refocus the debate? Maybe that's the, the where we should be focusing. Um, what is the most useful thing to safeguard livelihoods and jobs rather than focusing on the process itself? Doesn't it make more sense to, fo to concentrate on the content of the deal, like what Richard said? Um, and should we be really kind of playing the Tories at their own game, focusing on their objectives? And surely if we've learned anything over the last however many years that it's that coming together and challenging what do the Tories actually want to get from this not it's not all about what you know what what we desire um as as a Labour Party um and as Chris Bell said from the election defeat it, I think we have to refocus our debate as well um so how can we shift the Tory MPs without you know mounting a really aggressive leave remain kind of yes no campaign um, and just apply that that public pressure, um, you know, hold them to account for the deal that they set out in the political de declaration. Uh, you know, the oven ready Brexit deal that they that they promised, maintaining workers' rights, um, consumer and environmental protections, uh, all the list of things that they promised would be ready. Um, because I think getting the government to stick to the promises of that and the political declaration is, is going to be huge so should that be the focus instead that you know we need to try and pick the holes in all of that that they're not going to get this deal and labor probably will have to vote against it so we probably all agree here on where we need to get to that the end goal is something that you know better reflects labor's values the deal with closer partnerships um all the things that uh, everyone else has kind of outlined already um, and if the Tories don't uphold this, they've broken a serious promise with the voters uh, and will have caused economic and social harm. So by applying that pressure constantly and building it up throughout the year, um, then we can, we're kind of building up a psychological way out as well of how to, of how, you know, that the government haven't stuck to their promise. And that's how you can, I think, just reframe the whole debate now because a lot has changed since december and, and i think a lot of labor's values and position on brexit hasn't changed but we need to show the public that there's a a general that there's an alternative path so it's not being you know against no deal or requesting that this uh it, it doesn't just by being against something or requesting more time doesn't offer any alternative we need to visualize we need to allow people to visualize and see things um different under labor so i think we just yeah we should refocus any kind of binary pro or against positions does play into the tories hands um as christabel said they thrive off this culture war and want to do anything to try and fabricate it so you, we're seeing that all the time um and i just think Labour not calling for an extension, it doesn't mean that we're defeatist or that we're giving the Tories a free pass. We, we're not going to stop articulating all our demands and, you know, it doesn't, talk, it doesn't stop us from doing that on anything else. The majority, it, we, we talk about all good things and vote for them. Um, but this is the time to talk about what a deal could be, what is actually possible and try and really hammer that point that a good deal is possible and give the public a, a really strong alternative. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really great. Hamish, no pressure, but four good speakers precede you. Thank you very much, Laura. I'm going to argue that uh, Labour should call for an extension of the Brexit transition period, preferably for the maximum of two years. Uh, but to make that case, I think you have to prove a couple of points. One, that uh, an extension is right for the country. Uh, and if it's right, that Labour should call for it. Obviously, if it's not right, that's kind of an academic question. Um, I believe that a Brexit extension is right, uh, both for economic reasons and for health reasons. But to be absolutely clear, this is not about uh, calling for Brexit to be thwarted or for uh, saying that Brexit won't happen. It will. The purpose of the extension is very simply to get the best possible deal. And I think it's absolutely beyond doubt that without an extension, 
there is a very real risk, in fact, a high probability that we'll get either a bad deal or no deal by the end of the year. So the economic arguments for an extension, I think, are pretty familiar. You'd expect me to make them. I probably made them before. So in the interest of time, I'll just skip over those, except to say that there's a survey on our website showing that Labour business members were very, very clear. They're Labour Party members in business up and down the country, that they need an extension. Uh, they need time to prepare for the future relationship uh, with the EU. But in my view, the economic case for an extension would be strong enough, even without co coronavirus, uh, but after coronavirus, that case is even more compelling because with a health and, and social care crisis uh, that's uh, caused an economic shock that's unprecedented in, in our history, it seems to me that the only uh, sane course for any government of any party is to ask for an extension. First, to avoid the double whammy of an economic disaster of a bad deal or a no deal uh, Brexit on top of the economic disaster of coronavirus. And in my book, that's a disaster on a disaster, which makes a catastrophe. Um, but also it's, it's self-evident, I think, to most of us that refusing to seek an extension means doing two jobs badly in government, or even worse than they're already being done. Uh, uh, tackling the pandemic badly, while at the same time trying to tackle the EU negotiations badly which is why I say that no sane government would try to do both at the same time. Uh, they would ask for an extension, except for blind ideological reasons that they don't. But there's a further point, and it's a moral rather than an economic point. Uh, I believe very strongly that it is morally reprehensible for this government to ask other EU governments to spend an ounce of energy or time uh, on Brexit negotiations, which should be spent saving lives. So if you're with me so far, if you agree that it's right for the government to ask for an extension, the only question remaining for this debate is whether it's right for Labour to say nothing, to remain silent. And on the most important issue of the day for our economy and for the health of our people. For me, that question just answers itself. Should we stay silent or should we speak up? For me, it beggars belief that we're even asking that question. I don't know about you, but I didn't join the Labour Party to remain silent on anything. But I realise there are political considerations to take into account. Uh, they've been mentioned already, some of them. Uh, Christabel talked about how we don't want to sound like Ramona's. Uh, we don't want to lose votes in the red wall seats. Uh, Charlotte's talked about how we don't have the votes in Parliament to force an extension. Well, on, on the Ramona uh, argument, um, it's not a call for Remain. Um, as I've said, it's a call for the best possible Brexit deal. Uh, will it lose us votes? I, I don't think we know that. Certainly some of the recent polls have suggested that even uh, those who voted for Leave uh, do not support a no deal or a bad deal Brexit. And, and Charlotte, of course we can't win an extension in Parliament or, uh, against 80 uh, Tory uh, majority, but... <laughs> If we were to use that as a reason not to call uh, for opposition uh, to any mean-spirited, nasty Tory policy until the next general election, then we wouldn't say anything in Parliament, and we wouldn't oppose anything. Finally, of course, we have to choose our battles carefully um, on Labour territory, not on Tory territory. But why on earth would anyone suggest that it isn't prime Labour territory for us to call on the government to focus all of its energy on tackling COVID-19 before even thinking about starting negotiations or concluding negotiations on a future trade deal with the EU. I just finish on this. When we crash out of the EU with a bad deal or a no deal at the end of this year, when people ask me why Labour didn't call for an extension, I don't want to have to tell family and friends that we stayed silent for reasons of political expediency. It's time to do the right thing. It's time to speak up and time to be counted. Thank you. Brilliant. Five excellent speakers. Uh, thank you so much. That really, really great contributions from everybody. Um, I think we've got, uh, I've got the names of three people who I think want to ask questions. I'm going to suggest we take those three and others um, then raise your hand in the written sense. Pete Radcliffe is keeping a note on this. So I've got Michael Boyle, Campbell McGregor and Di Harris. If none of you wanted to ask a question, please say so. Um, otherwise, Michael Boyle? 
Are you there? Are you unmuted? Can you, can you hear me now? Ah, yeah, brilliant. Um, it's Doyle. Oh God, uh, I'm sorry, and I even know that actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, well, it's okay. It's okay. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's an easy mistake to make. Um, uh, my question is to uh, all the speakers: um, If there is an extension, uh, should the Labour leadership reconsider its position on leaving the Remain uh, Leave divide behind? Great question. Okay, and then Campbell McGregor. And apologies, I've probably got that name wrong as well. My first question. My question to the first speaker. Uh, you said that. Can you hear me? Yeah, brilliant. Yes. Uh, was it said involved? Was involved in a campaign to defend migrants' rights? Uh, is this a campaign to defend uh, rights of EU migrants or all migrants or who? So, sorry, could you say that again? Is this, is, this, is this a campaign? Is this a campaign to defend the rights of all migrants or or, or EU migrants or who? That was directed to Richard, yeah. No, the, first speaker, I'm not... the first speaker, yeah. Okay. And then Di Harris. Hi, yeah. Um, okay, so Jeremy Corbyn agreed to the 2019 general election because Johnson promised him that there would that no deal was off the table. That's that's the reason he agreed to the, the election, and now we are where we are. But Keir Starmer seems to be repeating history. Johnson has promised him he will get a deal and Starmer is saying we've got to allow him to get the deal that he's promised we, we will get. But at the end, when we don't have a deal, where, where are we? You know, we're in a dreadful position in Parliament now and the country's going to be in a dreadful position when we don't have a deal just because for some reason, we're saying, oh, the Tories have said they can do it. We've, we've got to let them do it. And I agree absolutely, totally with, with Seamus. Um, you know, when it all goes horribly wrong, what will be Labour's legacy? Will it be we fought against this disaster? Or will it be, well, they told us that it would be all right, so we just let them get on with it? That's no way to pull back the, the voters that we've lost already. Okay, great, thanks. Um, now, I didn't explain this to the speakers, but I'm going to sort of take you randomly, I think. Um, and I don't know if you want to have a go at answering each question or if there's just one that you want. I mean, speakers, you feel inspired. Um, but let's start with maybe um, Sasha. Okay, yeah, I'll just answer two questions. One is, um, it's, well, I, certainly I'm campaigning for the rights of all migrants. Um, I'll just leave that there. Um, so I, th well, I think that um, I, I really um, I enjoyed all the speeches. I particularly enjoyed Hamish's speech, as people see from me posting bravo in the chat box repeatedly. Um, but I think that even Hamish was a bit defeatist on the question of Brexit itself, which is that <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if, you know, look, as it is, we may well be defeated. We may have a, hot, a no deal Brexit and we'll be stuffed. But I think if there is a serious delay, um, then I think the wider question of Brexit will open up again, or could open up again, and that's one of the reasons that the Brexiteers don't want this. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't rule out that we sh that we we should be open to saying actually this is a madness, and you know if we can get a delay, you know that question should be revisited. That doesn't mean we have to pose it immediately as this is about Remain, which I thought was kind of a, a sort of bit of a kind of false counter position. The point should be leave or Remain. The Tories are, you know, are mugging you. Um, but um, but I think if there is a delay, then the question does open up again potentially. Okay, thanks, Christabel. Uh, okay, yes, I'd, I'd I'd like to address what what Di said. I mean, you know, I I, I, have, a, I have a huge amount of sympathy. I really I particularly wanted to agree with Hamish at the end. I I really really did. Um, but the fact is, it's not sort of Labour standing by and letting this happen. We haven't, we, we, the Tories have an 80 seat majority. They can do whatever they want to. We, 
you know, we lost the right to be able to influence policy on December the 12th when we lost that election. And the people decided that they wanted to go with Boris Johnson and his, you know, I mean, we can, we can say all we like that it was a fake message and it, and it was, but that was what the electorate decided. And, and we are in this position simply because the voters decided that they wanted us to be in this position. Um, I do, you know, and I think where, what we need to look at is what do we really want to achieve as an end game from this, given that it's not in our hands to actually stop the extension? Um, what, what is it that we want to achieve? And certainly what I want to achieve is for us to be an internationalist party, is for a close relationship with the EU, is for um, to secure migrants' rights, is for all of the things that all of the speakers have spoken about. But I just, I can, I, I think sometimes we just don't necessarily quite see and I certainly you know didn't when I was in the midst of it see how we were perceived by a lot of voters including it has to be said some moderate remainers when we look back at the polling we never had a majority of people who wanted a second referendum there were enough a small number of remainers who who thought you know fair enough you know we shouldn't overturn a democratic vote and you know I, I think all of those arguments are rubbish I'm not I'm not defending them but that's what people thought so I do think we just the best way for us to achieve that internationalism the best way for us to argue that we need to be close to the EU is to is to move away from those labels and I do think that if we back this extension which we have no hope I'm afraid of the Labour Party on its own overturning. We just land ourselves with the label that Boris Johnson wants us to have, which is of, which is of Ramona's who won't give up on, on overturning Brexit. And it, it breaks my heart to say all this, breaks my heart. But I think, you know, we've got to be focused on what we can achieve and what we, and, and what we can't achieve. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to ask Hamish just before that, if you want to ask a question, please put your name in the uh, chat. So, Hamish. Uh, yes, thanks, Laura. Um, I don't have anything to add to what Di Harris said, since she <laughs> seems to agree with me, so that's fine. Um, picking up what Sasha uh, commented on, uh, that I was being a bit defeatist. Um, obviously, I don't rule out um, getting back into the EU, and I suppose that uh, it's conceivable that we might achieve that before uh, we become the next government, but it seems unlikely. But, but defeatist, no, uh, just a realist, I think. Um, and at the moment, I think the strategy has to be as Richard outlined, which is to uh, work carefully through getting the best possible deal. And actually, Labour Business has come, to come up with uh, 10 tests of what a, a good fair trade deal would look like, not just for the EU, but for any fair trade deal, which would certainly rule out most of the things that Donald Trump is asking for or seeking to impose on us. Um, and finally, on, uh, on Christabel, uh, yeah, yeah, I think that uh, um, it is essential that we um, speak up even though we know that that won't change the outcome. I just, I just, for me, that the idea of staying silent is, is just too, too painful, too uncomfortable and wrong for, for Labour. So I, I really hope that Keir will speak up before the end of this month. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Hello, yeah, not much more to add. Um, I agree with everything that Christabel said. Um, I just think we need to, take a step back and look at the bigger picture of all of this again and just think with the in look at the reality of where we are um and it, it breaks my heart as well to kind of uh, you know that this is is where we're at but are we dan is anything is this going back into the i just worry that there's kind of a wormhole uh, the risk a risk of a wormhole debate opening up here uh in kind of drawing labor you know the government want us to argue against what they're trying to do and do we want to be dragged into that what to the you know so to any kind of identity politics again where we have to try and where we're defending our values and principles we know that and we've come through the last three four years um on top of that so i don't think people will forget where that this isn't what we would have history wouldn't forget really where we what we've argued for and the, all those arguments um, 
are there and it's not been I, 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 I don't I disagree with with Hamish about it being defeatist it's not it's being realistic about where we the the kind of the the current situation of where we are and what we need then the task ahead of us what we need to do and just refocusing the debate do we want to dance to the tune of of where of how the government are trying to set the narrative and say like they you know they just want us to to argue for one thing and be for it you know it's not going back to the being pro or against um being in the eu we're kind of past that um so yeah i just think that's um and i, I actually think i think it's to address um michael's point that maybe a a deal might happen if we've learned anything from the last couple of years it's that you know this run running everything down right to the wire um to the the kind of last minute things uh a deal very is is very possible um i certainly have every reason to think that it probably will happen so i think that the requests requested in an extension could be a, a whole distraction debate in lots of ways. Great, thanks Charlotte. And finally on this round, Richard? Yeah, the, the argument that they have a huge majority, so what we say doesn't matter, that applies to everything, doesn't it, that the government's doing logically. Um, and it's true we're not the best place to make some of these arguments, but quite often if the Labour Party as the opposition isn't making the argument, it makes it more difficult for others to do so. We saw this with Rashford, didn't we? If we were saying that, the fact that he said it as well put pressure on the government because they thought that what Rashford was saying would resonate because Labour was saying it as well, and we would steal an advantage over them in public opinion. That's what we've got to get to. Yes, it should be others making the argument. Industry, agriculture, traders, uh, uh, the pharmacists, doctors. But if we haven't also said we need more time to get a good deal, then the government can easily say, well, even the Labour Party's not arguing that. Nobody in Parliament wants that. You're out on a limb. That's a reason why, despite the fact they have a huge majority, we need to be saying things when they're right. Now, of course, we have to do it in an intelligent way. I'm not saying we should do it in a way that makes us vulnerable to them reopening the cultural wars and saying, you're, you're trying to stop Brexit. Brexit has happened. We need to do it, as I said earlier, in an intelligent way, putting the onus on them. It's them that said they would negotiate a comprehensive trade deal with no tariffs, no quantitative restrictions, covering all the key issues. It's them that said that um, there will be no, uh, no difficulty. All the cards would be in our hands, they said. The easiest trade deal in history, they said. It's oven ready, they said. So hold them to account. Say, you said you could do all this, in six months, it sounds a little bit sounds a little bit like your um, your app for identifying um, for tracing COVID, doesn't it? Bluster, you're not ready. You should have been ready. You're not ready. It's your fault. And this is about getting the best deal possible, not about reopening leave versus remain. And another reason to do it is let's not forget most Labour voters want us to do that and increasingly other voters. I don't know if you saw the polling that was done a few days ago um, from, by Best for Britain, uh, looking at the red wall seats. And there it was quite clear that a lot of red wall seats, people who'd voted to leave in some cases, were themselves saying, no, we need more time to get this right. So let's put down that marker. If this is heading for a fucking disaster, we don't want to be identified with it. We've got to be able to point at some point to the fact that we said something different, that we weren't tamely going along with what the government was saying. That's very important for the future of the Labour Party. It's very liberating, isn't it, Richard? I realised this when I left Momentum, the fact that you can say it's a fucking disaster. Mm -hmm. When you were an MEP, <laughs> I think you would have probably removed the expletive. 
Um, that is brilliant. All really great answers. Thank you, everybody. Uh, round two. We've got a long queue of people, by the way. Um, I've got Jenny, John, sorry, I'm got a surname, and Luke Cooper. And then I've got Ferk, Andrea, and Fiona, and then a Sheila. Um, sorry, you didn't get your surname. Um, if any of those people don't want to ask a question, can you remove yourselves? But let's start with Jenny. Jenny, Jenny, Jenny R. Don't know how many Jennies we've got. Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't think um, people in the Labour Party, people like us, shall I say, realise just how um, how how difficult it will be to, if the Labour Party says anything at all, the press are going to jump on us, the Conservatives are going, going to jump on us, Boris Johnson is going to jump on us. Like you say, it's just looking for an excuse to paint us as Ramonas. However, um, I still think maybe we should say something i agree with what richard said we need to say something so we don't get any of the blame for what's going to happen great thanks Do you didn't have a specific question no no well they've both mainly been answered <laughs> okay great um john and sorry there's probably more than one john john with a question mark and not a surname Hello. Um, can you hear me Oh yes, great. Is it a question? Ah. Um, well, sort of. It's, I encourage it's, you to turn it into a question because we've got a lot of people. Yes, it must be a, a proposition. What I think, I, I'm sorry, I missed all the speeches. I had problems with the software, but I've managed to tag on to the meeting at the end. So I don't know what was said before, but um, um, I, I think Keir Starmer, um, the worst thing he could have done would be to rerun the the Brexit debate right from the start, because people would have just said, oh, you're just rerunning, you know, you're, you're a Ramona, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. So he's very cleverly to one side and said, that's uh, been decided, that's for future generations to um, fulfill. So in, in that respect, he is then able to hold the government to account on what they can say that they are going to do. So they're saying they're going to do all these wonderful things, so he can point out that uh, they're not doing it if they don't do it. Now, the thing is, when you get to the end of the year, if they don't have a trade deal, if they go out to WTO terms, we know it's going to be a disaster. There's no infrastructure for dealing with imports, um, uh, you know, with the customs at the Dover, etc. So um, all that will mean was that we will get... Um, uh, you know the, the severe the shortages of, of, of food and supplies uh, all the all the um, uh, you know just in time chains will be broken for manufacture etc this this will won't be very good um, now is there, is there that, a, really I'm really sorry to interrupt you but there's a long people, list of people who've got questions to ask I've got more people than we possibly got time so unless you've got yeah, a question okay. I'm gonna have to move on to the next person right, I'm really well, sorry yeah. Given that situation, don't you think that that would be a good idea to exploit, as in let them have a disaster at that point in time, because that will show people that they're getting it all wrong, that it was all lies, that it was a, a, a joke. If you instead go for extending the uh, and and, you know, and, and what will happen then is they will organize a trade deal and we will we'll be worse off. But we won't notice that we're worse off because we'll be in, you know, down years down the line, and and things will happen slowly. So people won't know that we're actually worse off than what we would have been. What we need is actually a disaster to happen. Uh, you know, okay. short. The question is: the question is yeah. Should we let them have a disaster? Great. Okay. Yeah, very exactly. good. We got there in the end. Um, Luke, yeah. did you have a question? Oh yeah. So. Hi everyone. Um, so my uh, question is: do, do any does anyone on the panel um, think that it might have been a mistake for Remainers to put such store in the idea of opposing a No Deal Brexit that was never going to happen and wasn't a serious possibility, and that that left us outmaneuvered 
um, when it came to the inevitable, which is that Boris Johnson got a deal. Uh, we even took it so far that we turned down the opportunity to have a general election in which Boris Johnson would have been forced to argue for a no deal in front of the British public, but we said we didn't want that. So does anyone on the panel think that that was a mistake? And then does anyone else on the panel uh, draw the conclusion from that experience that maybe this time it's also the case that a no trade deal 2021 isn't going to happen either because the customs infrastructure for it hasn't been built. And that means that Boris Johnson, just as he did previously, has every intention of striking a deal. So the whole idea of extending the transition period is getting away from the thing that we should be really sharply focused on, which is what kind of deal we want in the first place. Okay, so we've had a couple of questions there from Luke. Good cheat. Um, let's start <laughs> with uh, Hamish. And if you could keep your, don't uh, answer where you like. And yeah, maybe yeah. Okay. Um, on uh, Jenny's point, I think I'm agreeing with her that all hell will break loose if we use the B word, and that's what Keir Starmer is concerned about quite rightly, but that isn't the reason, in my view, not to make a clear and compelling statement for an extension on the grounds that I argued for earlier. And I think you said at the end of your question, Jenny, but we need to say something, and, and I agree with that. Uh, as far as John is concerned, um, clearly we shouldn't be rerunning the Brexit debate. I think all of us have said at the beginning that this is not about stopping Brexit. This is about what kind of a deal do we have with the EU. And the notion that we need a disaster from which a phoenix will rise from the ashes is one that I reject totally. But I think maybe you should join another party if you want to pursue that idea. Uh, as far as Luke is concerned, I don't think it was a mistake to oppose a no deal Brexit. I mean, we can debate the strategy and tactics around the uh, election last year and Labour Together is coming out with its report tomorrow, which would be really interesting on the lessons learned from what happened last year. But I think that uh, as far as my members are concerned, we're absolutely clear that no deal or a bad deal, and I think they're very close to being the same thing for these purposes, means tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers, economic misalignment, and uh, real difficulty for businesses, small, medium, and large, to access uh, the closest and biggest market. So we must continue to argue against a no deal or bad deal Brexit. And I agree with you, focus on what type of deal we need, recognizing there will be some kind of a deal at some point, and we need to help to shape it, not least with countries other than the EU. Great, thanks. Um, Christabel? Um, so yes, to Luke's point, I, you know, I don't know, I, the, the, the sort of, the, the kind of shenanigans that went around on at the end of the year became sort of sort of this kind of vast game theory that that was I think anyone that thought that they could sort of strategize it was probably deluding themselves slightly. But I do I do think that there is there is a point in there that we did talk a lot about No Deal, and we did you know catastrophize it. And I I, I hate to I, I don't mean to use that word because it is a catastrophe and it would have been a catastrophe. But I think the way it came across to a lot of people was that we were making this huge fuss about nothing. I don't know if any of you tried to actually have a debate with Leavers about No Deal. And you know I would sort of say but but the British Medical Association says this and you know blah 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 blah. And literally I got back well what do the doctors know about it. And, you know, at, at this point, you're not, people were simply not prepared to engage rationally with this debate. They just simply thought we were scaremongering. And we did put a lot of political capital into that. And I do think that it now makes it very much more difficult to do the same thing again, particularly, as I say, and I, and I do think I, if it wasn't for coronavirus, I'm not sure I'd be arguing on this side of the fence. It's just that with this crisis that is just so overwhelming and so much displacing people's thoughts and emotions, I just don't think that there is the capacity really to go through another set of R, what will be seen by a lot of Leave voters as scaremongery. Again, I just don't think we're going to get the reception. And I think, you know, it's in, in the end, 
the people that Boris Johnson will listen to are not us. They're not our voters. They are Leave voters and they are Tory voters. So the fact if we're just simply playing to the crowd that already vote for us or already agree with us, we, we can't change anything. We can't win. We can't get what we want. We need to be able to see that there are people out there who, who d simply don't think the same way as, as we do. And if we don't do that, I do think we are just going to continue getting the wrong result, whether that's at the general election or whether as pro-Europeans in terms of maintaining a close relationship and perhaps even day one, re one day rejoining the EU. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sasha? Okay, um, I haven't got a lot of time to go into it, but I, I think the, the pandemic is precisely why we need an extension and precisely why if we thought we could get an extension, I, I really don't understand Christabel's argument on that. Okay, secondly, no deal Brexit. Um, I mean, I agree we shouldn't just talk about a no deal Brexit. Um, and you'll notice that I said repeatedly, also possibly a hard Brexit of some other sort. But firstly, firstly, I don't think we should rule out that it could be a no deal Brexit. I think it's entirely possible. Um, partly because of reasons the Tories might want that. And secondly, because things don't just operate on the basis of, basis of perfect rationality. But also any deal they do will be bad. And that's what I, I've got to say. I think it's alternative deal stuff. If we can't get a delay, I mean, obviously we should pressure them on everything we can, but if we can't get a delay, I've got to say, I think the alternative deal stuff is a little bit fantastical. Um, I, I mean, there's lots of other things I could say, but just one other thing. Um, I mean, I, look, I, I'm a Marxist and, you know, I, I, you know, I won't go into culture wars now, but I mean, they're, gonna, they're fighting a class war. And if you're scared, if people are scared of what they're going to say, um, if we try and delay Brexit, just wait and see what they do when a no deal or hard Brexit happens at the end of the year, that they will use it to, you know, I mean, even without it, they're going to attack living standards, they, you know, they're going to, you know, they're going to create a neoliberal economy, which makes the one we have now look like child's play. So, you know, either, there's some, there is something a bit otherworldly about this discussion, which is the Tories are not reasonable people, you know, whether you're a social democrat or a socialist, the Tories are not reasonable people that we can kind of chivy along. Um, so I think, you know, we have no choice but to fight. Okay, thanks, Sasha. Um, Richard? Yeah, the only reason we're here discussing this is, of course, because what we had was a blind Brexit. We left without the legal arrangements in place for a future relationship with the rest of Europe. That was left to negotiate after we left. And the, the government has fully exploited that by making very nice noises ahead of the departure date about it would all be easy, it would all be fine, signing a political declaration of future intent with the European Union, which had all kinds of commitments to it, which they have now turned their back to. So that's, that's why we're discussing what kind of deal and that's why we're discussing whether we have enough time to achieve a decent deal by the end of this year. We've all said we should focus mostly on the content, what kind of deal we want to, we would like to have. But let's not forget also on that, we won't actually influence the government. We're not going to make it change its mind. Boris Johnson isn't going to listen to us on the content any more than on whether we need an extension or not. What we are doing is laying down a marker vis-a-vis -vis public opinion to say that we were on the right side, to say that we have got the right arguments, they are making a mistake. That is what we are doing in this. Let's have no illusions that we're going to persuade the government to change course on any aspect of this, content or timing. We're not. We need to therefore, among the things we're saying, not necessarily the main focus for all the reasons that have been said, to say we need more time. It makes sense to have an extension and turn that around against the government. It's only a matter of the next two weeks after all, because it's only within, by the end of this month that you can decide to have an extension. There are various theories that you could decide that later in the year. They are all legally very, very hazardous. It's not easy to do that. The withdrawal agreement makes it very clear an extension decision has to be taken by the end of this month. So it's only on the next couple of weeks that we have to put down this marker that there should have been an extension. 
And yes, we should do it in a way that, um, that has a wider resonance with the public precisely because of the coronavirus crisis. The argument that the government is blustering again, that it's overconfidence, that it promises it can do something by a particular deadline and then fails, that has resonance at the moment. They've done it over, the, over so many things in the coronavirus. PPE will be available by the end of this month. Uh, the app will be available by the end of that month. Uh, the testing capacity will be available by some other time. They've failed again and again and again to meet deadlines in the coronavirus crisis. We can perfectly well argue that they're in grave danger of doing the same thing now with these negotiations with huge dire consequences. It makes no sense for the government to box itself into the corner with the shortest possible Brexit deadline. Of course they should extend in order to achieve a good result for Britain. Brexit has happened. We're talking about the results that we need to achieve. Thanks, Richard. And Charlotte, did you want to add anything? Um, I'll just add quickly on the, uh, the kind of, uh, the, where we are with, you know, being, um, I, we agree, I agree fully on, with all of you on the disasters of no deal and all of the things it could do. But I think this, this is past the point, we're past that point. Um, and the thing is now that if we're asking them to extend, is, are we not just getting but too bogged down in the details and are we missing the real point that we're getting, we have a Tory government with a sizable majority and the reality is if, and we have to seriously ask ourselves the question, if, they, if it was extended, um, I think someone made the point, if it was extended, then for another year, two years, would the government pursue anything differently? Probably not. And at the minute, everything, um, the time and everything is entirely up to the government. Not one Tory MP has dissented. So why do we want to give the unreasonable people more time to negotiate something that they don't, haven't said that they're going to do anyway? It's, it's, it's a kind of distraction argument from the real picture of what's going on. So shouldn't we be pragmatic and try and influence the deal, what, influence what we can influence? Um, and I think that we're not, it's not a case of being silent or not saying anything or not being opposition or treading on eggshells. Egg it's choosing the, the type of battles that you're going to pick with the government and when. Okay, thanks, Charlotte. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we are running out of time. There are lots of people who want to ask questions. Um, let's try to get at least another couple of rounds in quickly. Um, I've got one written down by Neil Merva, who said some time ago, what are the top three issues to challenge the government on to ensure that we get the best possible deal? Um, so maybe just a couple of you would like to answer that. And then uh, Liz Minns, I think you've got a question. I don't know where you are, Liz, if you're still there. And then Alan White as well. Liz, are you there? I can't find Liz, but I think Alan's there. Okay, well, whilst, we, you're, whilst you're trying to find Liz, let's ask Alan. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, I, um, I think we should make sure we don't over fetishize the 80 seat majority that the government has. Um, it's, which is to say that we mustn't read that as representing a groundswell of support for them. Um, it's true it is an impediment in Parliament, but I can't remember the exact figure. I think the Tory vote went up by about 1.2%, uh, the 2019 GE on the previous one. So it's more an artifact of the first past the post mm -hmm. system than it is of than it is a representation of some kind of shift, it seems to me. I don't understand why people are reticent about arguing for the Labour Party to be arguing for an extension. I is mean, that's a question. <laughs> if, if you like that, is, yes, that can be the question. The point of politics is to get power, but you have to be arguing for things that are right. And, and it is clearly, as others have argued, in the interest of the country to request an 
extension and I agree with Hamish's point that I don't want to be in a position where I can't say that that's what we argued for. Great, thanks. And we've seen your flag as well, being held by a teddy bear. Great Thank backdrop. Thank you. <laughs> I dressed my set. Did you find Liz, Pete, no? Okay, so um, Fiona Murray, are you there somewhere out there? And Andrea Pizarro? Sorry, Peter's got the unenviable task of finding people. Yeah, I think Fiona's mic is on now. Fiona? Yes, I'm on. Okay, um, I've got, um, well, a, possibly a stupid suggestion, but um, given that, um, first of all, that the June, the end of June deadline was set um, way back now, um, before we'd even had any idea about the coronavirus um, coming, coming on board. And given that we've only started to talk about Brexit again very, very recently, because everyone's been focusing on the COVID situation, mm -hmm. would it be worth, um, rather than campaigning specifically for getting this extension to the transition, getting an extension of that June deadline? So maybe campaigning for that date to be moved to say September when people's minds are less focused on the COVID situation and maybe giving everybody more time to think about Brexit again because we haven't been thinking about it for so long. Okay, thank you. So panelists, I'm gonna suggest that you don't all answer every question. And I'm just gonna pick on Richard Corbett to briefly answer that last point about the deadline because I think that there probably is a technical answer to that and then the yeah. rest of the, the withdrawal agreements which has been signed and ratified by the, the British Parliament and the European Parliament specifies the, a transition period with the status quo for one year that can be extended by a decision to be taken no longer than the end of, of June 2020 to extend mm -hmm by either one or two years in a single decision by that deadline. It's enshrined, therefore, in an international treaty. That's the status of the withdrawal agreement. You cannot change that by a decision of the Joint Committee um, or by any other means than signing another international agreement that then is ratified by every national parliament of all 28 countries involved. That's such a tall order legally that it's not, it's not possible. I know it was all written before the COVID virus, but that's the position that we're in. Mm. Question that I'd like to quickly answer was, what, what are the things we should go for? And I would say go for access, to access, 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 access to the single market for exporters, for our supply chains, access to the, um, student exchange programs, research programs, police cooperation, and so on. That's what we should be going for. But it does show the fundamental dilemma of Brexit. If you go ahead with Brexit, either you distance yourselves from the EU as a country, you don't, you have a huge economic hit then because you're not in the single market or the customs union, you've disrupted your trade with our main trading partners, or you attenuate that, you stay close, in all these ways that I've said, but then you have to follow the rules without having a say on them anymore. Neither is a good solution. Of course, that's why we were against Brexit. But in the current circumstances of economic catastrophe, because of COVID especially, we need a second solution, stay close. Yes, it means following the European rules on the single market and so on to a very high degree. But after all, at the moment, those are, are all rules that we participated in making. They're mostly, not all, but mostly good rules that we can live with for the time being, for a long time, actually. Certainly for, for a hell of a long time compared to what the Conservatives would do with those rules in terms of tearing them up. So we should go for the close relationship in terms of what we would advocate as a kind of deal that we want, bearing in mind that we have no influence anyway over a government with an 80 seat majority. But in terms of public opinion, that's what we should be arguing for. Okay, thanks, Richard. I'm gonna ask the panelists to only add where they disagree, if you see what I mean. Um, I, I didn't disagree with myself at all. <laughs> Part of the calls, Christabel. 
Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. I, I, I am here. Um, just, just a couple of points. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people have been saying, well, you know, we shouldn't be doing nothing. And, and I agree, we shouldn't be doing nothing. I don't think we are doing nothing. We are saying that you need to get a deal. And I absolutely think, you know, I do think we could be doing more to say what kind of deal we need exactly along the lines that Richard Corbett has outlined. And we need to hold them account for if they don't deliver that, if they do deliver a deal which is going to sell our workers out, which is going to lower our food standards, which is going to destroy our manufacturing and our agricultural industries. We need to be holding them to account for that. I do, you know, I do have an awful lot of sympathy with what a lot of people have said. And when I use the word Ramona, I am using it not because I believe that we are, but that is how we are perceived by a lot of people. And it's not just the extreme leavers. I mean, it's, it's an interesting, we never got, we never got um, a majority in favour of a second referendum because there were a bunch of moderate Remainers who were always kind of a bit on the, on the fence, who didn't particularly warm to the People's Vote campaign, who thought that the Leave vote should, should, should be upheld. There is an awful lot of those people out there. And I think we don't necessarily, we don't necessarily engage with them and we don't necessarily think about them but there's an awful lot of people who just don't you know they're they're not they're not sort of particularly partisan on one side or the other and i think the problem is is right now they are distracted with covid and and we will be labeled as ramonas the right-wing press we know how vicious it is we know how you know dominic cummings and his crew will manipulate this it's you know, it's it's not something that I want. It's not something that I'm that I'm in any way happy about. But that is what will happen. And I think if we do get labelled as such, it will make our voice. It will make us. It it will it will it, you know diminish our voice on other things. It will diminish what we are saying about getting a decent trade deal. That is my fear. Is that in fact we will end up worse off with a smaller voice if we allow the right to label us in the way that they want to label us. Okay, thanks Christabel. We've still got uh, 116 people. So at least 116 of you um, don't mind the fact that we've gone over time. I'm gonna suggest like another five minutes probably. Um, anyone nodding? Yeah. Um, but I'm afraid we're probably not going to have time for a huge number more questions. Sasha, do you want to come back in on the last couple of questions? Yeah, I, I take it this is our last chance to come back. Well, I think I'm going to give you all a minute at the end, actually. Um, but if you yeah. want to just answer the questions. Uh, yeah. Okay, that very well, just two things then. Um, one is that on the stuff about, about being perceived as Ramona's, and I mean, I, th I think we are getting the press and the magical power of the Brexiteers and actually a lot of you know a lot of what seems like their magical power is just the fact that our movement didn't fight actually didn't fight around this and that's still the problem and it is I want I mean I suspect that a number of the people who are saying here who are saying we need to be careful like this are far more enthusiastic about the EU than I certainly am and yet actually are lagging behind a lot of leavers who according to the polls can see perfectly well that it's it makes no sense not to have extensions so I think we should not be hypnotized um and secondly I, I don't accept the counter position of you know we're being you know the labor's labor's will be really strong opposition so we shouldn't distract from that by arguing for an extension I mean I, I frankly I think I don't think labor's will be very strong opposition on much of anything um and you know I think I think in general Starmer's strategy is let the Tories trip themselves up and say as little as possible and um it's not a good one Oh, that was, <laughs> thank you. That was succinct. Um, uh, Hamish, have I already- Is this my last one? Well, I'm happy to make this my last one minute because I'm sure everybody's thinking about, you know, switching off soon. <laughs> I certainly, I certainly need to go off. Oh, and do okay, something. great. So that make this but, your last one. Can I make it my, my last minute? Just, just two very quick things. I just want to add to what Richard said about alignment of standards should be the, the goal of our, um, our deal. Um, I would add to that something that reflects the labor values that I think we should be pushing for in any negotiation, whether with the EU or other countries, and that's worker rights, uh, consumer protection, and environmental protection. 
all to be on a level playing field basis. That not just keeping what we've got now, but keeping uh, up with, with what the EU is doing. Otherwise, we know what the Tories are going to do to our workers' rights. And, and my final point would be to echo what Alan White said and, and what I said at the beginning. I, I think that um, when we all agree that it's right, that there should be an extension, mainly around the COVID-19 issue, and there I, I guess I disagree with Christabel, seems to me that's, as I said at the beginning, a much stronger argument for not spending any time on a trade negotiation and spending all our time on tackling the virus. So under those circumstances, the extension has got to be right. And what do we say to our family and friends if we're not even on record as saying that we support that extension? That's the question I can only answer by saying we should stand up and speak now. Okay, thanks, Hamish. Charlotte? Sorry, you're last again. That was unintentional. <laughs> All right, that's the last. Um, yeah, I'll give my uh, one minute kind of summary as well. Uh, no, just to... So, yeah, I just, I don't think that there's, I think the reality, we agree on, on most of the content and the, the, the end goal of getting, a, you know, the best possible deal and relationship. Um, I think that, that would, there's a risk that we just get lost in the detail here. So to spare that from, you know, that's been the case over the last couple of years as well. So how can we be pragmatic and on the front foot? And I appreciate both those things are really hard. And it's not a question of being against necessarily an extension. I'm not against the principle. And I don't think that's where the position where that the leadership is coming from. Um, but it's, it's kind of saying, you know, look at the last case record on Brexit and other things. It's not disagreeing on any of the points that anyone's really made um, for requesting an extension and avoiding no deal. But how do we, I think, just think we need to ask ourselves sincerely, is asking for an extension right now a sensible political strategy? Well, there's 12 days left or something until we have to call for it. So I just think as well that the political problem is presents that the longer the public goes without really sensing or tasting a sense of what Boris Johnson's Brexit is, then the more it is constructed in this fantasy world that they can talk about it and talk about us, the, the opposition kind of stopping them from getting there and that plays into their public narrative. So I just think stopping dancing to their tune and trying to a lot of you talking about trying to take away the narrative but I think this is a wormhole of being like pro or anti um, extension in this sense is is a bit being dragged into that wormhole so I think yeah we all probably agree on where we need to get to um, but how as the opposition should labour focus its energy in the meantime um, and I just think with the narrative and the time frame against us it's it should just be on the most pragmatic and, and effective way for now and it doesn't stop us from articulating any of the other demands that we, we have it, it isn't silencing on any of that um we do it on lots of other issues so it's not being silent at all okay thanks charlotte so look with apologies to uh, the four or five people who definitely had wanted to ask a question um i'm afraid we are now well beyond time um, someone has suggested, um, and I will come back to the speakers for a minute each, for those who want, Hamish doesn't, and I think Charlotte doesn't, but uh, if, if others want to say something. Someone has suggested we should have a poll, but I haven't got any technical capacity to figure out how we very quickly do it, other than you literally all putting your hands in the air. Um, but it would be interesting to know. There is um, a poll, there is a poll function. Ah! Look there's the a poll the oh my god there's a poll function there you go right well yeah 89 percent of you think labor should be campaigning for uh, an extension i guess that's probably a reflection of the fact that you're the people who at 10 past nine on a thursday evening have come to have a discussion about brexit um okay that's that's pretty convincing um Thasha, and or Richard or Christabel, any of you want to have a final minute? Yeah, very, I mean, just on the poll, it might be worth doing it again, because I think that was the start of the meeting. So it would be interesting to see if there's a shift. The, the one thing I'll say is, um, look, look at the Black Lives Matter struggle. Trump has a 100% presidential majority, and it's not as if the right wing in America aren't strong. 
Um, and yet, you know, that struggle has changed the political narrative very quickly. And that's in the context of, you know, of the pandemic and it being hard to demonstrate and everything else. So I think the mainly young people have gone out on the street. Um, uh, you know, that, that kind of action isn't a political strategy in itself, but it's a lot better than the political strategy of remaining silent. Thanks, Sasha. Um, Christabel? I'm, I'm, I'm not got a huge amount to add, to be honest. That's fine. Um, Richard? No, I think um, there, there comes a time in the meeting where everything <laughs> but not yet by everybody and we're, we're, we're at that. We're there. All right. Well, look, well I'm said, Richard. Excellent <laughs> summary. God, if only all politicians were that succinct. Mm -hmm. look, mm -hmm. I'd like to thank everybody. I think the fact that so many people joined the meeting and have stayed for so long is testament to the fact that there is significant interest in this. Um, it is an impossible task to sum it up, so I'm not even going to really try the one thing strikes me, which is whether people want an extension to be called for or whether they think there is another strategy. I've not really heard anybody say that they think that the party is saying enough. So obviously for those of you who want an extension, the party's not saying enough. But nobody who doesn't want an extension has argued that the party's got it all right. So my one takeaway would be that actually in the 12 days that remain, the leadership needs to step it up. Now, if it steps it up a bit, but doesn't ask for an extension, the vast majority of people on this, it's still 89% are not going to be happy. Um, but presumably you would agree that, that even firmer demands about the sort of deal we want would be preferable to where we are. I mean, I think Sasha probably in a way summed it up that, that you more or less said the silence is deafening. Um, and I suppose the fact that we're having this discussion just 12 days out from this critical crunch point might indicate that also we activists have been a bit slow to this, although obviously your three organisations have not been. Um, but I guess if Keir Starmer appeared in my living room tomorrow, I would tell him that he needs to step it up, whatever the it is. Um, and I don't feel much dissent from any of you on that, however clever you think the tactics may, may, may be. Um, Thank you to everybody. I think Mike Buckley and Michael Chesson and maybe Sasha or others from Labour for Socialist Europe. I don't know if you're going to regroup and have a part B. Strikes me that there should be a part B because in 12 days time we are going to be in some sort of new world. It would be great to see everybody back again and apologies again to those of you who didn't get the chance to ask your questions. I think this has been recorded. All of the organisations have dumped things in the chat, so please check, um, check out the Labour for European Future and the alternative mandate documents and uh, safe travels back from your living rooms to your kitchens or wherever it is that you're now commuting to. Um, stay safe wherever you are and thanks ever so much for joining this evening. Okay, thanks. Thank Ciao. You. Great job. Thank you. Thanks.